WCW NWO Road Wild 98 took place at the Sturgis Motorcycle Rally in South Dakota on Saturday, August the 8th. These Sturgis shows generated no gate revenue, they're very unique in terms of location, and most reports state that if you were a wrestler who couldn't care less about motorbikes then these annual trips to South Dakota were more of an inconvenience rather than an opportunity. Speaking of opportunities for wrestlers, or a lack thereof, Jay Leno's in the Road Wild main event. He's teaming up with Diamond Dallas Page to battle Hulk Hogan and Eric Bischoff. This show is pretty much known or unknown because of that main event, but we have a healthy undercard to it Road Wild, at least on paper. Let's check the event out and we'll see if the thousands of biker Michael likers in attendance enjoyed the show. Ming vs The Barbarian opened up Road Wild 98. Ming just returned to WCW recently and on his first night back he attacked his own tag team partner, picking up where the two left off just before the Minger got sidelined. Ming tries to headbutt Barbarian a few times but that doesn't work out too well. The two then clash like a pair of sumo wrestlers with Barbarian gaining the advantage, though Ming instantly turns it around with some open palm thrusts. Barbarian's able to hit Ming with a belly to belly suplex, Ming replies with a pile driver. The Barbarian then dodges a diving headbutt from the man called Ming and he makes his opponent pay with an overhead throw from the top rope. Basically, these two are just taking turns beating the hell out of each other and I, for one, am all for it. Jimmy Hart distracts Ming but Barbarian can't make the most of it. The two throw down until they both get tired, Barbarian slow to drag Ming out of the ring, but Barbie thinks he has the match won after Ming gets his head slammed on the ring steps. Barbarian pulls off a back body drop to set up the kick of fear, but Ming applies the Tongan death grip and Ming ends up winning via pinfall. Post match shenanigans include Jimmy Hart and Hugh Morris attacking Ming. The Minger tries to fight all three guys off but he ends up taking a top rope splash from Jimmy Hart. Yeah, Jimmy grew a sack in Sturgis it seems, and Hugh Morris also pulls off the no laughing matter moonsault. Jim Duggan comes out to fend off the bad guys, the bikers love Hacksaw but clearly Ming didn't want any help. And the match wasn't what anyone would call good but it kinda suited the theme and overall ruggedness of this pay per view and venue. Harley Davidson? I can hardly wait to get out of this Sturgis shithole. Get ready for some Saturday Night -like Fever with Ross Winderkind and some disco dancing with the Disco Inferno. So for some reason, those absolute buffoons at WWE Network removed Alex and Disco's entrance and I have no idea why. There's nothing questionable about it except for Alex's massive broadverse but seriously, the contrast between the competitors and the audience makes this entrance pretty much essential. Tokyo Magnum's gonna stand on the outside and learn from the masters as Disco and Alex take on the public enemy. Disco wonders if there's any showers in Sturgis because these people are filthy and Alex calls the audience a bunch of dirty bikers. He's not wrong. Alex is just too fast for Flyboy Rocco Rock. The crowd chant Disco sucks as Alex performs an arm drag and the brilliant Daz Wunderkind performs a top rope wrist lock takedown, followed by a drop kick. Disco tags in and he winds the crowd up by dancing. That sellout Tony Schiavone says people don't want to see this, they want to see wrestling, so Disco performs a schoolboy and he celebrates afterwards with his teammates. Johnny Grunge completely kills the mood by, you know, actually fighting his opponent, so Disco hits a clothesline and he tags in Daz Vonderkind. Alex performs a missile dropkick and he smacks Rocko Rock 2 for breaking up his pin attempt. Public Enemy begin working together and this is where they have the advantage over the dancing fools. It's all about experience. What Public Enemy don't have though is the absolute legend known as Tokyo Magnum, and Tokyo being at ringside pays off when he hands Alex a trash can. Johnny Grunge gets taken out too so Rocko Rock heads to the back and he finds a ladder. When Alex and Disco take a hit they decide that this match just isn't worth it so they head to the back and they leave poor Tokyo standing on the rampway. Just when Tokyo thinks he's done for, our heroes return with a table. Disco then announces that this is now a street fight so the public enemy head back to grab a toilet seat in the kitchen sink, essential items for a brawl at Road Wild. Grunge and Rock get the better of Disco and Alex though Alex is able to suplex Rocko Rock onto a trash can. We also get to see Alex completely annihilate Grunge with that kitchen sink. After more trash can shots, Tokyo Magnum decides he's gonna help out, but the plan backfires and Tokyo accidentally hits Alex. 
The cameras cut over to Disco and Rock on the outside and we totally miss Alex smacking Tokyo before leaving his partner high and dry. Magnum leaves too so Disco's all alone. In the public enemy take their time setting up three stacked tables on the outside. Sometimes these spots can look a bit weak but this one looked pretty good with Disco getting sent through all three tables. Back in the ring Tokyo comes back to try and help Disco but he again does more harm than good. The public enemy are able to win this tag team match at Road wild. It's not a bad match if you keep your expectations in check, but it's not something you're going to watch more than once. Raven vs Saturn vs Kenyans up next. These three had an excellent triple threat match on Nitro and it's good that they were given more time here at Road Wild to do it again. Kenyon didn't show up on Nitro this past week and Raven said Kenyon either got taken out by the flock or he joined the flock. Saturn's going to find out during this match, so Perry could be at a disadvantage. Raven tells Kenyon to go for Saturn, but Saturn gets the better of Chris. Kenyon's able to pull off a swinging neckbreaker though and Raven then hits Perry with a chair. Raven then throws the chair to Kenyon and it looks like Kenyon's a little confused. Perry knocks the chair out of Kenyon's hand and then, on the outside, Raven attacks Chris, so I guess Kenyon hasn't joined the flock after all. All three men fight on the outside, the audience is completely silent. When it gets back in the ring, Raven sits in the corner while the other guys throw punches at each other. Kenyon and Saturn realize that Raven's enjoying this a little too much. So Raven gets drop kicked in the dick, he deserved it. Raven takes a back suplex and a neckbreaker combo. Kenyon takes the role of John Kronos and we see the total elimination. And then Chris pulls off three Russian leg sweeps in a row while holding on to Raven. Saturn then performs a top rope leg drop, but the problem we have here is that Kenyon and Saturn won't let each other pin Raven for the victory. After Kenyon's fisherman neckbreaker, Perry and Chris decide to beat the hell out of each other and this allows Raven to attack both men with a steel chair. The match goes to the outside with Kenyon performing a plancha and taking both of his opponents out. On the rampway we see once again why Raven was the absolute master of taking guardrail bumps and the three men fight all the way up to the road wild stage where Saturn takes a pile driver and Kenyon takes a drop kick. Saturn dives off the stage, the spot looked good but the audience just aren't reacting at all. Back in the ring Saturn's able to hit Raven with an exploder suplex, Saturn puts Raven in a sleeper, Kenyon puts Saturn in a sleeper and a jawbreaker from Raven brings all three men to the canvas. Raven then tries to even flow both of his opponents but only Saturn takes damage and this allows Kenyon to throw Raven out of the ring for a spot that honestly didn't pay off too well. Kenyon climbs the scaffold around the ring and he misses his target. Back in the ring though Saturn doesn't miss his death volley driver but Lodi runs in to save his leader and he pays for it with a gargoyle suplex. Horus runs in too with his trusty stop sign but it's Lodi who ends up getting hit along with Raven. Swear to god these flock guys are useless. Raven takes one more death volley driver and Saturn wins the match. I thought this one had some great spots. I like Saturn and Kenyon pulling off the total elimination and the fight on the stage was pretty good too, but I think I was expecting a bit more after watching their Nitro match. It's still a decent bug, just not a great one, and you know these three are capable of way, way more. To be fair too, the audience didn't provide much energy, and this is a problem that's also noticeable in the next match. Rey Mysterio took on Psychosis next. There's no story here, but the winner will become number one contender for the Cruiserweight Championship. The two started off with some mat wrestling and it didn't really pick up until Rey got hit with a clothesline. Psychosis pulled off a sit down front suplex that looked great and this looked pretty good too. Psychosis using the ropes to try and pull Rey's arms off. Rey was finally able to fight back after getting a boot up when Psychosis came off the top rope. Mysterio pulled off an excellent Hurricane Rana that he set up from a cartwheel and he followed this up with a crossbody, but Psychosis got back in control after a sit down powerbomb counter. The bout slows down again when Rey takes a devastating, deadly nerve pinch and if there's anyone who appreciates a good old nerve pinch it's this audience right here at Road Wild. Psychosis then pulls off a seriously impressive electric chair suplex, the crowd couldn't care less, and the match goes to the outside where Ray takes a dropkick. 
Back inside the rope, Psychosis applies a half Boston Crab before hitting a top rope Hurricane Rana. He then goes to the top rope and Ray drop kicks him to the outside, and this did get a good reaction to be fair. Ray follows up with a somersault senton and back in the ring Mysterio pulls off an Arabian moonsault. The match ends when Psychosis clashes into the ropes and he then gets his head planted into the canvas pretty bad when taking a west coast pop. Rey Mysterio wins and Rey will face the winner of tonight's Chris Jericho vs Juventud Guerrero Cruiserweight title match. Next up, Chavo Guerrero came out to face Stevie Ray. Pepe had a little stage fright and Chavo had to convince his stallion to face these backer Michael Lackers at Road Wild. On Nitro, Chavo stole Stevie's notary stamp and Chavo thinks he can now create legally binding documents including driver's licenses and marriage certificates. He's made himself a new document that says Chavo Guerrero's the TV champion and not Stevie Ray, so Chavo tells Stevie to hand the belt over or there's gonna be trouble. Stevie, of course, isn't prepared to give Chavo the belt, so Chavo says the match can only begin when Stevie shakes his hand. If you remember back to Bash at the Beach, Chavo submitted when locked in a deadly handshake so Stevie isn't gonna do that either. Chavo gets in a cheap shot, a low drop kick. Stevie just stands there though and Chavo tries to follow up and Guerrero quickly realises that he can't hurt Big Stevie. Stevie follows Chavo around the ring, Guerrero tries to attack when Stevie gets back inside the ropes, but all Chavo's doing here is annoying the champ. Steve gets angry when Chavo tries a sunset flip, Guerrero gets choked out and he has to poke Stevie in the eye to free himself, and then the match devolves into a game of cat and mouse with Chavo constantly running away from his opponent. Eventually Stevie stops chasing Chavo and he lets the challenger run right into him. Stevie then performs the slapjack and Chavo Guerrero gets soundly defeated at Road Wild. After the match, Stevie says he's not finished with Chavo just yet. Stevie Ray is not a joke, but when Stevie goes to attack Chavo, Chavo, Uncle Eddie runs down to help his nephew. This is quite the turn of events, seeing as Chavo and Eddie drove each other crazy. Stevie Ray leaves, Chavo doesn't seem too thankful for Eddie's help, so we'll have to wait and see what happens between the Guerreros on next week's Nitro. A legitimate reason to buy Road Wild 98 was to see the long awaited battle of the Steiner brothers. If Grapple fans didn't buy the show to see Jay Leno then they might have tuned in to see Rick and Scott go to war, but the match doesn't take place. It pisses off the fans in attendance and I'm sure it annoyed fans at home too. JJ Dillon comes out after Rick's entrance and he says the match has been cancelled. Apparently Scott's out of action for two weeks following Rick's chair shot last week on Nitro. Buff Bagwell brings Scott out on a stretcher, it looks like that chair shot almost ended Scott's career. Bagwell says he re-injured his neck when getting out of the ring on Monday too, so Rick won't be wrestling anyone tonight at Road Wild. JJ Dillon says the WCW doctors verified what Scott's doctor said and Scott definitely won't compete in this match. But Scott has to wrestle Rick within the next 45 days or he'll get fired. So the match is set up again for Fall Brawl in Winston-Salem, and the announcement makes Scott jump from his stretcher just before Rick gives chase. I definitely appreciate the heel work and this does play into Buff and Scott complimenting each other's acting skills on Nitro these past few weeks, but it's an advertised match that gets called off during the actual pay per view and for that it's definitely a piece of bad business. Bait and switches aren't good during weekly TV shows, at pay per views they're pretty much unacceptable. Fear not though because we've got Brian Adams vs Steve McMichael next at Road Wild and obviously this makes things a whole lot better. Brian Adams, biker king and liker of Michael, comes out wearing a bandana he bought 10 minutes prior while Steve wears a Chicago Bears jacket. Mongo gives a clean break and he says that's how a good guy does it. Adams gives a clean break too so even an NWO guy can fight fair sometimes. Actually, no, forget that, look at this. Brian says they fall for it every time and he's absolutely right. Check out Mongo's offense here, that's some confusing shit. Mongo then tries a forearm and look at Vincent. If you manage to confuse Vincent of all people then you're doing something wrong, or maybe you're doing something right, in Mongo's world nothing makes sense. Brian Adams is like what the hell's going on before stepping back in the ring. Steve lays in a few right hands and Brian catches Steve out when McMichael goes for a big boot. We get more nerve pinch action next as things continue to get worse at Road Wild, but here's Mongo going over the top rope, always fun to watch. Vincent throws Steve into the ring steps and Adams has to stop Mongo from ripping Vincent's head off. Brian then misses a middle rope knee drop, McMichael pulls off a few three point stance tackles, and then we get more confusion when the two men run into each other. I think Adams was going for a throat thrust or something, but 
I don't know. The referee gets mule kick so Vincent grabs a chair. The plan backfires of course when Vincent hits Adams accidentally. And Steve McMichael wins with a tombstone pile driver. Absolutely brutal in the most beautiful way possible. Steve says to the camera that the horsemen are coming back. I can't wait big man. Because Chris Jericho defeated Dean Malenko on Nitro, the Iceman's not allowed to wrestle Jericho again for the Cruiserweight belt. JJ Dillon, however, announced that Dean was going to referee the Jericho vs Juventud Guerrero Cruiserweight title match at Road Wild, so Chris is at a disadvantage tonight in Sturgis. The bikers in attendance actually get really into this one. Jericho's pre-match promo helps him get a little heat when he says he rode his smoking Honda motorcycle into Sturgis, and he calls the bikers in Sturgis a bunch of weekend warriors. And as soon as the bell rings, we learn that Dean Malenko isn't going to take any of Jericho's shit tonight in this Cruiserweight title match. Dean gets in Jericho's face when his corner break takes a little too long, and the absolute fine WCW production team in Sturgis completely miss when Dean grabs Jericho by the hair to throw him into the corner. The crowd popped for this one, and I think the simplicity of the story here really helped the fans get into the match. I'm not saying the backers were simple, I'm saying that the beer was probably kicking in towards the end of the show. Guerrero misses a corner dropkick, but he doesn't miss when going airborne. Guerrero slides under Chris's legs, and Chris gets jaw jacked on the ring apron, and Hoovy pulls off a springboard dive to the outside that hurts Guerrero just as much as Jericho. Back in the ring, Hoovy pulls off a slingshot leg drop before applying a chin lock, it's always good to see. And the two have to save a springboard crossbody spot when Hoovy slightly overshoots his target. Hoovy's aerial attack gets caught out by Chris and we see a pretty unique military press into a tombstone pile driver. Chris then performs a vertical suplex, and the cruiserweight champ then takes some time to get himself a little heat. This kind of thing's working really well for these fans, and Jericho knows it. Chris continues to be as arrogant as possible in between moves. Hoovy's forced to take a time out, and when he gets back in the ring, Jericho stays in control with a body slam, a running senton, and more chin abuse. Chris calls the fans idiots as the two get back to their feet, and there's a loud Jericho sucks chant when Hoovy counters a suplex. Jericho misses his lion salt. Hoovy takes control with a head scissor takedown. Guerrero then goes upstairs, and he takes Jericho down with a flying front wheel kick. You think Hooventude's gonna build up for a big babyface comeback, but he gets stopped in his tracks with Jericho's signature double powerbomb, and the crowd are now back to booing Chris relentlessly. Gotta say too, Dean Malenko's been a great referee so far, he's stayed out of focus and he's only doing what he needs to do in terms of calling the match down the middle. Jericho performs a springboard shoulder block and afterwards he blows a kiss to the beautiful fans here at the Sturgis Motorcycle Rally. Back in the ring, Jericho's not too pleased with Dean's count speed and Bobby Heenan rightfully says that Chris is in control and he shouldn't worry about the referee right now. There's a little hope for Guerrero when he hits a DDT and he follows this up with a Hoovy driver. He then goes for the 450 and Jericho quickly stops Guerrero from pulling off his signature move. Chris then performs a superplex, and both guys take a rest before going into the finish. Jericho applies a lion tamer. Hoovy makes it to the ropes, but Chris thinks he just won the match. He puts his hands on Stingo Malenko, but Dean keeps his cool. And the match continues on with Hoovy throwing punches at Chris in the corner. Hoovy accidentally hits Dean. Chris takes this opportunity to hit Guerrero with the cruiserweight belt. Jericho then slaps Malenko across the face to wake him up a bit, but still, Guerrero kicks out at two. Chris can't believe it. He goes for a corner attack, but it gets a bit rough when the two competitors start punching and slopping each other. Dean pulls Hoovy away from Chris, and Chris decides to kick Malenko from behind, and Dean's not going to let Jericho get away with it. Malenko helps Guerrero in performing a top rope Hurricane Rana, Hoovy covers Jericho, and Hooventud Guerrero becomes a two-time cruiserweight champion. Malenko takes Jericho out during Hoovy's celebration, and while I would have been happy if Chris remained champion after this match, the finish was still good and the match was well received by the fans in Sturgis. This was easily match of the night. Chris Jericho's been on a roll recently and his work here to get this audience properly invested in a match shouldn't go unnoticed. As mentioned too, Dean Malenko was a very good special referee and take nothing away from Guerrero neither. We have seen him mess up quite a few times on Reliving the War, but he had a good match here at Road Wild 98.
Scott Hall challenged the Wolf Pack to a black and white versus red and black battle royal at Road Wild, but world champion Bill Goldberg entered the bout so he could get his hands on the giant, completely changing the dynamic of the contest and taking the focus away from what was originally supposed to be a Wolf Pack versus Hollywood war in Sturgis. I thought the NWO Battle Royal was a good idea at first. When Goldberg threw his name in, it then became predictable and almost pointless. Nothing against Goldberg, by the way, I just prefer if he was involved in a different match. Representing the black and white, we've got Scott Hall, The Giant, Kurt Hennig, and Scott Norton. Scott's survey says that the fans are here to see the Wolfpack and Goldberg, but still, it's one more for the good guys. On the red and black side, we've got Kevin Nash, Sting, Lex Luger, and Conan. And then, we've got the world champion, Bill Goldberg. You can get eliminated in this one via pinfall or by going over the top rope. You think the two NWO factions are going to team up to eliminate Billy Boy, but no. Instead, Goldberg watches everyone else fight at the opening bell and he only goes for the giant when the opportunity presents itself. Nash tries to kick Scott Hall in the face, but Scott ducks it. Goldberg gets whacked instead, so Scott goes for an outsider's edge, but Goldberg ends up eliminating him. Kevin Nash then eliminates himself so he can go to the outside to continue fighting with Scott. Okay then. Goldberg spears Kurt Hennig. He then takes his time waiting for someone else to come after him, and it's the giant who once again tries his luck. The big man's able to bring Bill down with a Russian leg sweep, but Goldberg shakes it off and he takes it out on Conan. Conan's next to get eliminated. Jan takes the opportunity to hit Goldberg with a back suplex and Kurt Hennig lays a few boots in. Goldberg gets up and Kurt gets speared again before getting sent over the top rope. And then Goldberg eliminates Sting and Scott Norton at the same time. Luger then gets speared and the giant eliminates the total package, so it comes down to giant and Goldberg just like that. Jan surprises Billy Boy with a choke slam. Goldberg sits up like The Undertaker before spearing the big man. The world champ shows some phenomenal strength by hitting the giant with a jackhammer, and giant gets eliminated via pinfall. That cheeky bastard Tony Schiavone says that each elimination could go towards Goldberg's overall undefeated streak, giving Goldberg an extra six wins or whatever it may be. But the commentators don't give their official streak number, so we'll leave it until Nitro next week. So with that being said, let me give you the reliving the war counter. Remember back to the July 27th Nitro when Goldberg defeated Brian Adams? That same night, after Jan chokeslam Bill to end the broadcast, Jan and Goldberg had a dark match and Goldberg won. The following week, after Goldberg speared the Jan on the 3rd of August Nitro, the two had another dark match and, of course, Goldberg won. Again, Jan took a loss in an untelevised bout a few days later on Thunder, and there's no way I'm counting Road Wild as six victories or whatever the case may be. So, the RTW Street Counter sits at 126-0 following Road Wild. We'll get the official WCW count on the next episode of Reliving the War. Clearly, the success of Bash at the Beach in terms of buy rate got Eric Bischoff thinking about bringing in more celebrities for WCW pay-per-views. So the main event of Road Wild 98 features Jay Leno teaming up with Diamond Dallas Page, The Battle Hollywood Hogan and Easy e Eric made fun of Jay by hosting his own NWO Later show during Nitro broadcasts. The crowd absolutely hated these segments, by the way. And over on The Tonight Show, in retaliation, Leno made fun of Hulk Hogan. Bischoff and Hogan took over Leno's show and DDP came to save the day, and Leno agreed to appear at Road Wild to compete in a WCW pay-per-view main event. That's all we've got here, folks. That's it. Whereas Carl Malone was passable in the ring and Rodman could be passable too if he wasn't hungover, Leno wasn't much of an athlete, let's just put it that way. So we've got DDP and Hogan doing most of the wrestling here and the other guys are going to come in and stumble around the ring for a bit. After the entrances, Leno throws some water on Hogan and Bischoff, and from here, it's a lot, and I mean a lot, of time wasting. You know the drill by now, and you know exactly what I'm talking about. Kevin Eubanks, leader of the Tonight Show band, stands on the outside as DDP and Hogan start the match off. Hogan shoves DDP around and he throws his bandana as the crowd chant for Dallas. DDP drives his shoulder into Hogan following a wrist lock. Hogan slaps Dallas across the face and DDP smacks Hollywood right back. Even Jay Leno gets a smack in before DDP hits a swinging neckbreaker. Eubanks throws Hogan into the ring post and DDP tries to end it early with a schoolboy pin, but Hollywood kicks out. DDP ends up in the wrong corner and Hollywood thinks Easy e can handle it from here, so Bischoff gets tagged in and Leno wants a piece of the NWO. He's gonna have to wait though. Eric lays in a few kicks, but he ends up running into a big boot. Leno then tags in, but Eric runs away and he tags in Hulk. 
Leno backs off for a minute, DDP gives him some encouragement, but there's no physicality here. Instead, Leno ducks Hogan a few times and he makes fun of Hogan's bald head. Page tags in, Hogan goes on offense thanks to some dirty tactics, Bischoff tags in when DDP's been weakened and Easy e thinks he's got it all figured out as he lays the strikes into DDP. Page comes back with a few strikes of his own but Hollywood takes Dallas out with those brass knucks that don't look like brass knucks but we'll call them brass knucks anyway. Page gets covered and he kicks out but this just means he's gonna have to take more punishment in the NWO corner. Hogan spits on Leno while someone shouts Hogan sucks in the audience. Hogan replies, so does your mother, <laughs> fantastic. Page takes a big boot but too much showboating from Hogan leads to Hollywood taking a clothesline. Bischoff and Leno tag in, here we go. Bischoff rakes Leno's eyes and Jay replies with a low blow. We then see some fucking crazy bad punches from Jay Leno before he hits Eric's head on the turnbuckles and with mercy we get to the finish. Bischoff holds on to Leno so Hogan can get in a free shot but Hulk ends up hitting Eric. DDP clotheslines Hulk out of the ring, then Eubanks gets in the ring to hit Bischoff with a diamond cutter. Leno covers Eric, Eric's shoulder is clearly off the mat but the ref counts anyway and the babyfaces win the match. The NWO launch an attack after the bell, the crowd start chanting for Goldberg, so the world champ hits the ring and he takes Hogan and Bischoff out with a spear. In fairness, the crowd did seem to enjoy the ending of the match but it's easily one of the worst WCW main events I've ever seen put on pay per view. Give Leno credit though, he had hardly no time at all to train I'm sure, he was completely out of his element here in regards to any kind of physicality, either real or scripted. He also got paid a ridiculous sum of money I bet, so you can't really blame the talent for this one. DDP and Hogan had an impossible task at Road Wild 1998 and their effort should be appreciated, but this match was only put together to create media buzz to the detriment of long term fans of World Championship Wrestling. And no matter what the outcome was gonna be, it would have zero effect on WCW storylines. Road Wide 98 was the worst WCW pay per view I've watched for the 1998 Relive in the War season, no doubt about it. Jericho vs Juventud Guerrero was good, and that's the one and only match that I'd recommend from this show. I had really high expectations for Raven's triple threat match but it just wasn't as good as what I hoped. Disco and Alex's tag team match was alright I guess, but these aren't matches that I'd tell folks to go out of their way to watch, you know. The main event was an absolute slog to get through and while I understand bringing in new viewers with outside sources, it isn't something I care to see in pay per view main events. This pay per view is a great example of the undercard guys completely outperforming everyone else and very soon those same undercard guys are going to look elsewhere for better opportunities. If you made it this far then I thank you very very much from the bottom of my heart. Let's see if we can get some better vibes going in next week's episode of Reliving the War. Thanks again for watching guys and take care. <laughs>